At this time, let's begin today's event, The Future of Quoting in Home Insurance, sponsored by LexisNexis Risk Solutions and hosted by Digital Insurance. I would like to introduce your moderator, Pat Spear. Pat, you have the floor. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Our topic is going to address the changing nature of risk and the number of rapid changes taking place within today's homeowner's insurance marketplace that are causing personal lines carriers to pause and rethink how they're quoting this line of business. Our agenda reflects this with our discussion focusing on current challenges that are basically um, including back-end processing, customer service, improving profitability, and um, a, a number of other issues. Also, some key trends, top emerging trends, in fact, in home insurance quoting. We're also going to be talking about key data sources to tap into and how people are actually incorp using actually using their homes today, which is very different than it used to be, by the way, just the basic use of the average American home, and incorporating these trends into best practices that can be employed in your business today. We have two experts with us today re representing the insurer's perspective as well as the technology solution provider's perspective. It should be, it promises to be a great discussion. Left to right on your screen, George Hosfield is Senior Director, Home Insurance Solutions at LexisNexis Risk Solutions. George manages all aspects of the company's personal lines property vertical, including overall strategy, profitable growth, new product development, and partnerships. He also is responsible for a number of industry-leading data solutions, including LexisNexis Territory Index and LexisNexis Property Data Prefill. We'll also hear from Rob Galbraith. Many of you know him as the author of the new Amazon bestseller, The End of Insurance as We Know It, and he's also Director of Innovation at AF Group. He's been called a global insure tech thought leader and is known as a mentor to many in the industry. We seem to see Rob everywhere, a popular keynote speaker. He's presented on topics of innovation, insure tech, and the future of insurance, as well as the role of insurance in disaster preparedness and mitigation. As Jessica told you, this is an interactive webinar, so in the spirit of information sharing, we're going to ask you a polling question here. And I encourage all of you to participate so you can learn what your peers and competitors are doing, and then you know give our um, participants um, some information that they would not have otherwise had, then our experts are going to discuss. So let's take a look at the question. What do you see as the most critical area to improving your customer's experience within your company? Is it ease of application and quoting, proactive response to customers' needs, pricing accuracy and establishing the right coverage, upfront underwriting accuracy? Again, what's the most critical area to, that's, that would be a single, single answer now, to improving your customer's experience with your company. Ease of application and quoting, proactive response to customers, pricing accuracy and the right coverage, or upfront underwriting accuracy. Let's take a look at the results. Okay, here we are. Ease of application and quoting, a solid 50%. Next up is pricing accuracy and establishing the right coverage, another challenge at 22.7%. Proactive response to customer needs at 18.2%, and upfront underwriting accuracy at 9.1%. Okay, well, we're going to get into the discussion now. And um, I wanted to bring this up first in terms of current challenges, how these polling results relate to current challenges. Then we're going to talk about some trends in home insurance quoting. So, you know, for example, um, I'll ask both of you now, Rob and George, to reflect back on those results and, and see if they don't make sense now in terms of the challenges that you're seeing in the industry. George, you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so my name is George, uh, as, as Pat uh, alluded to earlier uh, with LexisNexis. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised by the results. I, I think they make sense with, with what we kind of see and hear in the market. Um, there's always this natural tension, I think, between um, it, an easy quoting experience and then the, the the two next variables that were on that list, which are anticipating the customer's needs and providing um, you know precision in, in the, the the rating. Um, to a, to a certain extent, asking for more information means making a a 
less streamlined quoting process that isn't terribly friendly for the consumer. So, so really, I think that it kind of fits very squarely with the, the topic that we're going to be discussing today. Right. Rob, what about you? What about looking at improving profitability as a challenge as reflected in these results? What does this tell you? Yeah, I think George hit it on the head in terms of uh, the speed um, of the quote versus accuracy of the quote. Um, I actually found as a, as a long-time underwriter, very interesting that underwriting was kind of last on that list. And I think uh, people are getting a lot more comfortable with um, understanding kind of the overall evaluation based on a property uh, using geospatial intelligence to understand uh, the risk to hurricanes, wildfires, et cetera, um, understanding, you know, uh, the condition of the home, other things. So it's, I, I think it's a good sign that, that, that people are, um, once they have the address, uh, they're able to use a lot of third-party data to um, and, and other sources of information to kind of establish the risk from an underwriting acceptability standpoint. So I really think it's about that, uh, that profitability and the accuracy of the rating. And we know that um, also if we don't get the rate right up front, um, and you know, find out more about it later on, and that causes the, the renewal price to go up, then that's a shopping opportunity um, and kind of creates churn in the book. So I think that's something that you know, getting it as active as you can that first time at new business is critically important to folks because it's not just for you know, hopefully be able to, to, to sell and, and buy coverage uh, this time, but also uh, to be able to keep that customer long term. Exactly. Well, and if you think about spinning that forward into some of the bigger issues and the way home insurance has been quoted and purchased over the years, um, what what are we seeing that's changing now? Because obviously the traditional way is, is morphing into more modern ways of responding to the customer and speed and everything else. George, what do you think about yeah, the biggest I mean, issues? If if we just look at historically um, kind of the reputation that homeowners insurance has, I think from the consumer standpoint, um, and, and unfairly or fairly or unfairly, we, we often get compared to auto insurance on the homeowner side. Uh, but certainly, com comparatively, home home quotes have been much slower, much more tedious. There's been a lot of of questions that the consumer hasn't necessarily been able to answer. Um, you know, I, I always um, get a chuckle out of when I'm asked, you know, do, is your is your kitchen average or above average or below average and you know to me my, I love my kitchen my, my kitchen is always above average but whether that really is true in the grand scheme of things I really as a consumer don't really know um, so there's the, the slowness the tediousness of the process historically we're starting to I think see some migration away from that kind of laborious Q&A interrogation of the consumer which I think is good uh, there's also obviously and I think um uh, Rob was was getting to this a little bit too. He was talking about renewal, but even during the quoting process, when you go through and you provide a lot of information, and then you find out that you don't pass an underwriting criteria. Um, I had this personally when I went through a, a, a quote with a carrier, only to find out that after I put in all my information, uh, some of which was PII, some of it was like social security number, things like that, and then I couldn't pass any further because I had a dog. Um, that was on the, the blacklist for breeds. Those are bad customer experiences. Um, but in general, um, I think we're getting more comfortable as an industry in knowing that there is going to be a lack of exactness in any specific quote, um, but that we can overall, through creating a, a stronger experience and better use of predictive modeling data and analytics, come up with the right overall answer. Um, that, that an insurer can be very well positioned um, to both be profitable and to provide a good customer experience. And I think that's part of part of what we're seeing today, beginning with maybe with some insure techs and some more innovative carriers, but certainly, um, you know, ev ev with every passing month, we, we see a little bit more progress with, with carriers moving down that right. path. Well, from the policyholder's perspective, you know how are how is the purchase experience changing over over the years? I mean, obviously that has really evolved. Um, you know, not just counting mobile technologies, but instant quotes and such. Yeah, I think Pat, the um, 
the days where you set an appointment and walked into the agent's office and spent an hour answering questions about a particular property that uh, maybe you haven't even purchased yet. You just want to know, well, you know, I'm interested in this home. How much would it be to insure this home? Um, and I may be considering four or five different homes. Um, you know, those days are, are, are really over. Consumers, of course, want to be able to do business digitally. And, and you mentioned mobile, and they want to be able to do it kind of in the moment. Um, so uh, oftentimes insurance may be 40th on your list, uh, but in that moment, all of a sudden it becomes number one, and you want to be able to get that, that fast, reliable quote. And then as soon as you're, you're done and you kind of make a decision, then you know, it does tend to, to, to fall off of your radar. Um, and so later on, if you do have a claim, certainly you know you will you will take all the time that it uh, it takes to to understand your policy and to kind of go through the contract, what type of deductible you have, what limits, and so uh, certainly you don't want to surprise at that that end. So I, I think consumers are um, just kind of a lot more uh, demanding of uh, home insurance today, but. They then again, they're thinking about it the way they're thinking about other products, right? That they order from Amazon and whatnot. It's just part of the, the purchase experience. Um, so it's it's a challenge for insurers because it's not just you know something that gets shipped and if you don't like it, you send it back, you know. Um, but at the same time, those are the evolving customer expectations that are out there. Yeah, and if I could add on to that, I mean, it's it's um, you know. Rob mentioned, you know, eventually you have a claim, right? And so eventually when you have that claim, it's really important that the coverage and the expectations and the education of the consumer happens. And so while on one hand we have a a push in the industry to get to this, you know, instantaneous quote with one, two, three points of data, um, it's also really important that insurers don't lose sight of the, the role that they have to provide kind of value-added service as well to the consumer. Uh, because, um, you know, as, as you get into it, um, you know, it, it may be one thing if you're a, a young adult getting a renter's policy, um, but as, as the consumer and even the millennials, you know, um, I, think, I think the research is showing that even the millennials need some level of consultation in the process. It just may not be that they're setting up that meeting with the agent that, he, that Rob mentioned, um, but they still want to make sure they get that intelligence and get that adv advice. Uh, so whether that comes through the anticipation of that consumer's needs using data on prior coverage or, or other aspects or of exposure around that household or that individual um, so that the, the carrier can proactively push Op options, uh, coverage options, and, and you know other kind of um, advice to them about how they should be properly covered, or just educate them around the risks of not being properly covered. Uh, it's right. important that that uh, I think uh, insurance companies don't just go for the quick and easy at, for the sake of quick and easy without expecting that there to be some sort of um, value add that they should be providing with their consumers as well so that they have a, a successful um, insurance experience even when there is a claim at the end. Right. And even away from claims as well, the role data can play uh, to cross-sell or upsell during the quoting process. And like you said, George, the idea is you're educating the consumer as you go, the policyholders becoming more aware now of some of the other coverages that are available to them. So. Would you both agree that data plays a pretty big role in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead, Rob. Okay. I'll just I'll, I'll let you chime in too, George. But uh, I'll give you a concrete example. So um, I recently got a quote in the mail from uh, a very large top five company, uh, a local agent, um, and it looked like a pretty attractive quote on the surface. It was less than $500 a year. Well, I pay about $2,000 a year for my homeowner's insurance. So paying $500 sounds very attractive. But when I looked at the coverage A, it was about a fifth of what my coverage A actually should be, what it would take to rebuild my home. It was a ridiculously low amount, quite frankly. And if you had grabbed any sort of tax record or then you know, any type of, you would know that that was not a sufficient amount. Now, I happen to know that because I'm an insurance professional, but it, I, I sure think that, you know, many consumers out there that, that don't know what coverage A is, um, certainly would see that price point and, and, and would jump at that quote. And so you're setting that consumer up 
the failure either up front or, or later on, right? To be an unpleasant surprise. Either you know they 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 call and they they go ahead and get the quote and then they get it at the the proper coverage A amount, something that's more reasonable, and the price goes up significantly. That's a big sticker shock that's unexpected. But you know if you were to issue at that coverage A that's wholly insufficient. Um, that could really be an issue down the line, certainly to realize I don't have anywhere near enough coverage um, to, to, to replace my, my home, to rebuild it to the standards of it. So, you know, I think that's what we're kind of talking about. It's not just about speed and ease. You know, it's nice to get a quote when I provide information from this agent in the mail. Maybe, maybe that is an opportunity. If I saw that price, that I, I might be motivated to, uh, uh, to shop. Uh, but that's not the, the way to do it. So relying on data, yes. But it's got to be reasonably accurate, particularly certain things um, like the, the the home value is a critical one to get right. Yeah, right. And, and just just tagging on to that, um, you know, at, at my organization we do see a lot of data, and we can see a lot of variation even on the same homes around things like coverage and coverage A and other coverages on the policy um, over time, and it really does kind of point to that um, twofold. A, you know. Either somebody's overpaying for coverage, somebody's underpaying for coverage, um, uh, or somebody's not covered enough. Uh, and and uh, certainly, I think um, for carriers to really try to get through this process to provide the best customer service, a lot of it too is, you know, the, the carrier themselves has to capture the necessary revenue to, to to overcome the risk. And so, utilizing things like like prior um, policy limits and coverages and so forth uh, can really be a nice tool to make sure there's some guardrails around that so that the uh, the coverage when you have new business coming in doesn't end up being kind of wildly off because a, 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 customer, a consumer will often chase the best price in the absence of the education on why that may not be the best product for them. And so that's, again, where the, the, the agent or the insurer can come in to really make sure that they're, they're heading down the right path for, for them and for their own security. Well, speaking of agents, I'm curious to hear both of you talk about the role that agents play in this because we've talked about mobility now. We've talked about, you know, easy apps and easy, quick information. But where does the agent stand in this evolving marketplace as an emerging trend? Uh, George, you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the agent could be a big differentiator. Um, the um, there 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 are going to be. Uh, Pockets within the market where you have different consumers that are looking for different things in their in their buying experience, and I mentioned renter, renters before, where you, the consumer, you know, if you want to typecast the the renters consumer, you'd assume perhaps they don't have quite as many um, risks. They may, they may be on the younger side. They may not have quite as many risks to to be concerned with. The complexity of the insurance transaction may be more simple, and the kind of very fast. Um, limited uh, information, limited consultation, uh, customer experience may be right for that consumer. But I think uh, even when we talk about the, you know, uh, millennials and younger folks um, who are now reaching a, a point where they're not so young anymore, they're, they're having kids, they're buying houses, they've got multiple cars, they've got umbrella policies, uh, they, there's, there's a role for the agent to play there. And I think that the, the channel is maybe, and the and the ease of the communication, um, mode of communication are maybe the, the most important things. I mean, uh, I don't think quite as many insurance policies are being sold in the, uh, you know, shaking hands on the way out of church like you might imagine back in the old days. Um, more and more are being done on the web, um, not just through the, the Internet, but through chatbots, through um, chat with live people. Um, through uh, internet uh, web web pages, so there there's going to be that that point where um, the agent does have the opportunity to provide that consultation. It just may not be in that face to face uh, conversation that maybe it was in the past. And you can put me amongst those who who don't like to to you know pick up the phone and call somebody. I'd much rather deal and ask my questions to my agent through um, a chat function or something like that. And I don't think I'm alone in that regard. And so the agent is in a great place to differentiate the carrier based on level of service provided, but it has to be done in the channel and in the methods 
that are most comfortable and and and, and uh, uh, preferred by the consumer. Okay. Rob, you agree with that? And what is what about your baseline experience since you've worked with agents over the duration of your career? Yeah, so um, I actually agree with a, a lot of what George said. Uh, I've worked for both direct riders and, and uh, companies riding through independent agents. And, you know, honestly, Pat, what I see is people want to take the fastest path. And so the fastest path often starts online. Uh, they want to do a little bit of homework, a little bit of research. Um, but it often does include involving an agent along the way, um, either because they get overwhelmed, uh, quite frankly, with some of the, the choices and the, uh, those insurance terms that, that many of us in the industry know what they mean, but, but are kind of foreign to consumers uh, that make it challenging. Um, they understand this is the biggest asset that they're probably going to ever have in their life, and so they want to make sure that they get the insurance coverage right. So while they don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time acquiring their home insurance policy, um, they they do tend to take the time to make sure that they've got it right. They they they, they want to be educated, and so um, just as you might do some uh, research online, uh, if you're uh, you know, having some type of medical symptoms and you kind of want to know, well, I wonder what this could be, and you go on WebMD and, and do some homework, but then you're going to go to that trusted doctor, that, that, that physician, and kind of say, hey, is this research online? I think I might have these symptoms. It said I might have this. What do you think? And that doctor may say, you know, yeah, in fact, you know, you do have that, or actually that's not right at all. Um, you know, it may seem like that, but you've got this other thing over here, right? So you wouldn't want to self-diagnose and, and kind of, you know, prescribe your own medicine and Right now, you kind of want that that trusted advisor just to uh, validate sometimes, or to really you know help uh, cut through the confusion. Uh, consumers don't want to spend 40 hours a week online just to learn about home insurance, right? So at a certain point, I agree with with George, they're going to reach out for that professional help. Now, the way that they reach out may be over chatbot, and certainly uh, digitally enabled agents that are out there that have you know, Google AdWords, that have a, an online presence, that have a way to interact digitally, um, they may support that uh, customer without ever having that customer physically walk into their office. Um, right. And it may be over the phone or whatnot. So I, I think um, I, I'm seeing a lot of that. It's, I just want to take the fastest path possible, and that usually is going to uh, be some combination of doing some research myself, but also relying on a trusted professional. And, and, you know, and Rob, um, I'm sorry, if I could just add one more thing. Rob made a really good a good tie-in there with the, um, you know, the, the Google ad lines, the social media. Um, that's, I think, going to be key for agents, right, um, in terms of engaging these kind of online consumers. Uh, go to where they are. Uh, they're they're right. going to be reading Twitter. They are going to be on Facebook. They are going to be um, using um, – Search engines and so forth. So you know the some of the 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 traditional ways of advertising your agency may have changed, but it also positions you as a digital agent. And um, you know the the other thing to consider as as agents kind of go more digital is you know the the transfer of information becomes more on the onus of the carrier or the agent side. And so getting you know the, the deck page, which your agent may ask for your deck page today, to kind of help start jump the quote. Well, maybe that's a maybe that's a, a deck page that the carrier can go out and, and order themselves. Um, maybe that information about the home is information that they're going to be ordering from third parties. It's still important for the agent to be armed with the right information um, to both guide the the kind of core pricing and coverage A calculation and everything, but also to understand the right coverages and and who is this consumer that I'm quoting. And let me give them a quote that's really in line with their appetite for insurance rather than the appetite of the average consumer. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think something can be said for the smart IoT devices now in the house, thinking about channels. Uh, I don't know how many Tier 1 carriers are this far along the path, but, you know, what about the enablement of a voice channel such as Alexa, quote, you know, tied to the back office, um, do you both see this as on the horizon uh, for carriers of all sizes? Pat, I, I definitely think that is uh, something to be on the lookout for um, in the 10 years from now. That might be um, a way that homeless insurance is quoted. I, I've seen one company in uh, Germany kind of roll out similar functionality, but 
uh, usually more on the renter's end. I, I think um, home insurance is still too complex um, to do a full quote uh, over Alexa. Um, I, I think there's a lot right that kind of goes involved with that. Um, so I think I'm looking at those kind of capabilities. I, I think you know, George's point on the auto side, um, things like that are, are probably first up. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, something that you know, hear a lot of buzz about in the industry, and I do think um, maybe as that technology uh, matures over time, there's going to be a, a, a way to do that. Uh, but I agree with George. You know, it's, I think more uh, you know, chatbots and other kind of functionality that's built into a website or built into an agency a portal is, is more likely to happen than kind of the Alexa voice enablement uh, it's for the foreseeable future. Yeah, yeah, uh, I I agree. And I know we want to talk about data. Uh, this wouldn't be a, an active technology webinar without it. So uh, the key data sources um, to tap into for a more successful tomorrow, that's the title of the slide. But what I want to ask you is, you know, how are carriers leveraging data in order to accomplish this? And you both talked about the evolving customer experience and their demands. How is data being used to help satisfy that? George, why don't you lead us off? Yeah, so I mean, um, there, there's really two two di uh, dimensions that I look at this on. One is the speed, and the other is the kind of the customer experience, the proactiveness. Um, from a speed standpoint, I think, um, you know, without getting too, too insurance nerdy, um, you know, I think it's, it, a lot of it is about bringing the explanation of that risk as early in the process as possible. Uh, so that we can reduce the number of changes downstream. And so bringing up a lot of kind of machine verifiable content um, early in the process and shifting your rating explanation towards some of that machine verifiable content so that you're reliant less on the Q&A that you're going to be doing with the consumer down the line. You'll be changing the, the amount of, um, you'll be reducing the amount of price changes that you'll have as you get further down in the process. I think that that's kind of a key a key step to really go totally automated. Um, and then the traditional variables that are being used today, um, whether that be loss history or, or you know insurance scoring, um, et cetera, it's about bringing more of that up front earlier in the process so that um, you don't get to a point where, okay, I'm going to order a report on your loss history, and, and now I found out that you had two claims that you didn't tell me about, so now your price is going to go from you know a thousand to 1250 or whatever it may be, because that leaves a really bad experience with the consumer, and it, then it kind of sends it back to this, you know, cycle of churn with the consumer that's going to cause time, effort, and heartache on both sides. So it's really about getting it all right as possible up front, and things that you can't really count on your data for um, because it's self-admitted or you just don't really know, you're taking a guess, we kind of push that back or even out, out of the process entirely. Um, and then we look at providing value out added service. I think um, it, it really does a lot. You know, I'm a big believer in bringing in prior policy information into the quoting process because I do think that it really provides a great leg up to the carrier, to the agent, and actually understanding what they're trying to quote and understanding where that consumer does have gaps in their coverage that you need to attack, um, understanding if they have um, and getting data to support this, understanding um, that they have, uh, uh, they're renting their their home out, they're on Airbnb, um, they've got a business running out of their home. Uh, it's a second home, and, and, and maybe they're living somewhere else part of the year. These are all opportunities not just to make sure there's adequate coverage from the carrier, from the, for the consumer, but also the carrier has the opportunity to really um, find additional premium, um, and, and provide additional service and consultation to that consumer. Right. Rob, from your perspective, you know, with your years of experience as an actual carrier, where do you land with this? Um, is, was this a challenge for you at any point during your tenure with one of your predecessors, or how is it that this is happening in terms of the evolution of grabbing the right data for the right reasons? Yeah, I think, Pat, really the the ultimate um, that I know, you know, I've talked about conceptually with, with many folks in the industry over the years um, is to um, kind of have somebody 
you know, either geolocate right, based on where they're standing because they may be with a realtor shopping for that home um, and be able to kind of, you know, know them, know where they're at, kind of have that um, uh, context, and then be able to show them a picture of the house and say, is this the house that you're looking for that you want an insurance quote on? And they say, yes, that's the right one, and then giving them a price. I mean, that, that's really kind of the ultimate, right, where I don't have to ask you any questions at all. Well, uh, we're not there yet, <laughs> clearly. Um, but I think that is right, kind of the ultimate. And so, in order, if you, you're kind of you know moving towards that, and some people have certainly talked about you know, maybe only about you know three question application or something like that. So, um, you know, moving towards that, it, it, it's all about data, right? It's all about acquiring the data, about recognizing that hey, at the end of the day, there isn't a whole lot that the consumer can tell us that we can't find from another source, and we maybe not be able to find from another source more reliably than the consumer knows. I know. One of the things that's always confused me, and I think I get it, but it's so hard is, you know, I want to know the square footage of your home, but I want you to take out any non-living space. So I need to understand, is that a finished basement? Is it partially finished? Or is it not finished at all? What about your garage? You know, what about your attic? Do you have a space over your you know, you attached garage? Uh, you know, questions like, it seems simple, right? What is the square footage of your home? actually can give you very complicated questions and you know quite frankly most people don't know and don't you know have a good memory and so you know maybe there's intentional right kind of you know obfuscation there but i think for the most part people genuinely don't know unless they just bought the house or it's on the market i think they're not going to know that they may give you the best answer they know so you know that's the type of information certainly that you can uh, yet from a variety of different sources and there's also kind of you know algorithms to figure out well I'm getting multiple square footage back you know wh- which one is the right one certainly a um, trusted data partner can can do some of that for you or you can do kind of your own scoring if you have multiple data partners that have similar information you can kind of rank them and, and kind of say over time you know they seem to do well here or maybe one does well in one part of the country and another one has proven their value in another part of the country so you know, having relationships with data companies, doing your due diligence about, you know, uh, where do you get this information? What is your cleansing process? You know, how long have you been doing this? Um, those are all kind of key questions you're asked as you're um, looking at data providers and, and trying to uh, ultimately enable that kind of, you know, uh, no no question quote, I guess, is the uh, you know, end goal. Yeah, right. Well, and if you think about it, it obviates the need, having the right data obviates the need for a 12-page questionnaire that uh, the typical policyholder doesn't want to complete. And we, you talked, George, earlier you talked about making the ultimate customer experience or customer retention, and that's all around the brevity of it and getting the right information. But maybe having the data at your hand to be able to do that without putting the policyholder through that, right? So, all right, well, I want to move on now to talking about um, – Accounting for the changing nature of the home, how the house, the typical household is being used. Um, first, looking at this this slide, I, I had several different thoughts about this, but of course I'm not the expert. I'm going to let the two of you address this because there's a lot changing about how the policyholder lives their lives and within their homestead. For example, you know, renting out their homes, as you mentioned, George, earlier, um, Airbnb or whatever vacation rental by owner. And, Working out of your home office is another way. Um, how can carriers adapt to this in terms of accurate coverage, adequate coverage, the right quote? Uh, George, yeah. you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I work with a number of insurers, and I and I get stories, um, you know, hear plenty of stories about bad, good, and bad customer experiences. Um, you know. One of the key functions of insurance, right, is to understand the risk and to, to cover the risk, uh, and and then to fulfill to fulfill the claims on the on the back end when something happens. And I think it, it's both um, both to the carrier and to the consumer. Obviously, when there's a, a an uncovered loss where the consumer thought a loss should have been covered, uh, it's a it's a bad experience, right? Uh, Consumers don't want want that. Obviously, carriers don't want that because it, it impacts their their customers. It, in, it impacts the um, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a a PR nightmare as well, and and it's their customer too. So there's a, a good bit of benefit in making sure that a carrier understands what they're covered for. Or number under, knowing 
there's a good bit of benefit for the consumer to understand what they're covered for and, and for the carrier to understand the true nature of the risk, right? So um, examples like, uh, you know, the you know, there's always the, the little old lady, right? The little old lady who has the uh, piano teaching, piano lessons out of her basement, and then one of her students slips and falls, um, files a liability claim, and it turns out she's not covered because it was a commercial exposure. Um, so that's an example. There's the example of the homeowner who rents their house out on a short-term rental website. Um, there's a, an injury at the swimming pool, or there's a, a, a fraternity party that creates a big, uh, a big issue in the home. And because they've rented the home out in violation of their policy, um, that's not covered. So that's a bad situation all the way around. And so what what the industry I, I think is, is moving towards is really a, a hey let's let's educate the consumer when there's a need to educate the consumer. You can't have the three question, fifteen second quote, um, and have that opportunity to educate every consumer. But if you can identify the consumers that need the education, then you can have that process that kind of leads them down that path. And so I think as we look at how the, the nature of the home is being changed, it is with things such as short-term rentals. It is with things with you know, increased numbers of home-based businesses. And um, even there's increased numbers of people buying vacation homes, which means that there's going to be more second homes out there. There's going to be more vacant homes out there that are either going to be rented out or they're going to be vacant. And in either case, that changes the, the risk profile of the home. So the insurance company needs that data, and that data is available to, to help them understand where are the red flags that I need to step in and really provide that education to the consumer. And I think that's okay. really one way that carriers can adapt moving forward in terms of how they can um, better uh, serve their customers in these areas. Right. And, Rob, you know, we, if you recall back in the day, I'm saying that now, this is not even a few years ago, but the whole idea behind straight-through processing for quoting the fact is, though, in your experience, I, I'm not sure that that's possible, especially with exceptions and the way the home is being used today. Do you want to address that and the importance of the right data, getting getting it all together? Yeah, I, I, I think um, I know. You know, in in kind of you know past years, um, streamlining uh, application questions was a really big focus. Um, especially if you're trying to be able to offer a home quote um, digitally. Um, so I distinctly remember actually kind of combing through old underwriting rules, and um, we had one rule that basically said, um, you know, you cannot have a, a vet clinic in a mobile home. We said, well, that's kind of an odd question to ask because we don't write vet clinics and we don't write mobile homes, so why are we asking people about their vet clinic in the mobile home? So those are the types of things that, you know, we've really kind of you know, come at to, to, to streamline to your point, Pat. But now what we're starting to see, as George mentioned, with the ever-evolving nature of the home is, is what I would call more dynamic kind of drop-downs, right, or, or dynamic questions. So solar panels is a great example. of just seen a you know, huge rise in the number of people that have solar panels um, on their home. Now, depending on when those solar panels were manufactured, they may be very vulnerable to hail, or they actually may be more resistant to hail than the underlying uh, roof shingles. Um, you may be selling power back to the grid, right? You may just have a couple of panels, or you may actually have the whole side of one part of your roof or the whole roof entirely. Um, how are those panels affixed to the roof? Um, you know, can you get them off if, if you were to sell the house and the new homeowner doesn't want them or not? You know, and does that create vulnerabilities with, again, the attachment between? So, uh, you know, you might want to ask the question, what, you know, do you have solar panels on your house? If you don't, then we'll move on. But if you do... Um, we might want to know, well, are you selling the power back to the grid? Maybe there's an opportunity to, to have some lost income if something were to happen there or not. And you could kind of customize maybe a, a coverage for you know, almost a, a business interruption type, uh, you know, for, for a, a homeowner to be understanding that, hey, in this case, their home is making a little bit of money because they're selling money back to uh, the utility company. So I just think um, uh, companies are kind of moving to that where they're really kind of um, understanding when they need to ask questions and when they don't can kind of you know, move on just to, to um, not just customize the coverage to make sure that kind of your standard HO3, you know, HO9 policy is in place, but, but honestly they'll offer some custom endorsements and, and other products that uh, better serving uh, 
uh, the market to make sure that there is coverage for some of these activities and not just that, you know, hey, if it's outside the normal quote unquote use of the home, it's excluded. Right. Well, and I, I want to, I, I've been thinking about this. We've covered a lot of territory here, uh, a lot of different topics. I've kind of um, back and forth from the back office to the front office to the need for data, the idea that the the policyholders' um, requirements are changing, all of that now. Let's talk about incorporating some of the trends that we've talked about and best practices into the business. I, I guess maybe the most basic question is where should a carrier start? Um, Rob, give us your, your perspective, and then I want to have George add, add his. You know, uh, I think the, the term customer experience is, is probably, you know, overwrought when every company is saying that they, you know, have the best customer experience or they were focused on the customer experience. But, you know, I think doing some of those, um, what they call ethnographic studies, um, you know, really kind of, you know, seeing how consumers are trying to purchase home insurance. And so that might be kind of observing them online or that might be um, going out and doing surveys, working with realtors, what, what have you. But I think it really needs to kind of start from there. And as you see, um, we've talked about different generations, different expectations, evolving technology. So I think as you start with that, well, how are people trying to acquire home insurance today? you quickly get a sense for, you know, what are some of the pain points and you'll have some aha moments of, oh, I never thought about that they were going to try to, to, to do that. And so I think, um, again, it's cliche, I apologize, but, you know, starting with the customer in mind first and then designing their process around that, knowing that a big part of your process is going to um, be, be you know, data enabled right to some of those third party data sources. The other thing that I would encourage folks to do is really um, what I think is a trend I don't see often enough and I'd love to see more of is, is uh, education through gamification. So my children love video games and we all probably play Candy Crush or whatever on our phones. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about games is that you can make a mistake, quote unquote, and it doesn't cost you, right? We have you know, multiple lives and we can you know, do different things. And so, you know, I think being able to have a quote flow or some type of gamification where you can allow customers to toggle things on and off or, or switch things, or, you know, maybe you can show an image of the home and if you set your coverage A, well, you know, this is how you, you can get two bedrooms back, but if you go to this coverage A, well, you get all four of the current bedrooms you have back. Um, I, I think there's some creative ways to, uh, maybe convey the same information that agents have done in the past, but just in a in a new way. So whether that's done by agents or carriers or, or others, I think that is a, really a wave of the future. Is just making sure that um, yes, you're educating them and you're getting them through the process at the same time. Um, you know, in kind of engaging way, not a oh, let me get this over with kind of way. Right. Yep. What about you, George? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what, what Rob was saying. I mean, it, it all starts with a carrier identifying, you know, who their customer is as well. So um, your customers may have different needs than uh, than the, the insurance company next door, right? Um, and understanding kind of what's your target, uh, demographic, uh, risk profile, et cetera, and then finding the way to find them and to educate them on the needs that are specific to them. I, I love the idea of, Education through gamification. I think that's a great way to put it, Rob. Um, there, there have to be new ways through these new channels to provide stronger um, consultation and, and advisory um, advice uh, to the customer um, beyond just the, the traditional agent interaction. And and so that's a, a great idea, a great path to potentially go down. Um, as are the other kind of engagement methods we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it, it comes down even to the advertisements the carriers put on the air, right? You know, making sure they understand really the needs of insurance, um, the needs they they may have with insurance and the reason insurance is there. Exactly. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left, and we want to get into some audience Q&A here. So um, we're going to try – we have a lot of questions in the queue, I don't want attendees to give up and hang up because obviously we're going to try and get to as many of your questions as we can. If we don't address your question during this live event, though, please know that someone from the team is going to be getting back to you. We don't want any question to go unanswered. Okay, so let's take a look at the Q&A box. And um, 
here's one that says, IoT presents the greatest opportunity to reduce risk. Are there companies using this technology to be proactive with the Internet of Things? George, do you want to lead this off? Yeah, sure. I, I, I can take a, take a crack at that one. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there today that are looking at the Internet of Things. And by that, there, you know, from what I've seen, there's, there's different um, various points along that continuum of, of educating themselves about the Internet of Things to actually putting things into production. I think the vast majority of carriers that are looking at the Internet of Things today are still in learning phase. Um, there, there are a number, certainly, that are giving um, discounts. Um, there are some that are, have done pilots with specific devices. Um, there's a you know a, a lot of um, kind of folks in the pilot stage, and there there are a, a couple I think that in some small way are beginning to to integrate some devices into to their product, but I think it's very much um, in its infancy right now. Um, I do think that um, there's a lot of opportunity with the Internet of Things, but there are also some potential roadblocks and or maybe speed bumps is the best best word. Um, and and the, the model that this is all going to take in the industry in the long term is still somewhat coming to um, fruition. Um, I do think that with the proliferation of data providers that are out there, there's a long-term solution that that enables you know a, a third party to provide clearinghouses and standardization and normalization of this information and serve it back to insurance carriers. I think that's probably going to be the way it, it ends up for a point of quote type of it solution, but there's all sorts of different types of applications that you can use when you think about the, the IoT devices, and maybe even less the device than the, the, the apps that um, integrate with those devices that could provide an opportunity for the insurance company um, to, to surface their brand and, 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 and improve the engagement uh, with their, their end consumer who may not honestly think about them you know, 11 months out of the year until they get their renewal notice or, of course, have a claim. So there's a lot of opportunities both from the, the, the pricing standpoint, the customer engagement standpoint, um, the, the underwriting and claim standpoint. Um, if I were to bet, I would say that probably customer engagement is, is the, the kind of leading edge for IoT getting into the insurance uh, industry. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're certainly looking very closely at everything that's going on in that, in that uh, market, and uh, I think it's pretty, pretty exciting, although it can't get here fast enough. It, it does tend to take a little while for these things to take hold in the insurance market. Right. Kind of like fits and starts, right? Rob, yeah. what do you think? Are companies using this technology to be proactive now? I certainly want to. The desire is there. Um, I do think there's been a hurdle that uh, a lot of folks have piloted and offered discounts. There isn't that direct tie to losses yet because that takes time, right? It takes time for those losses to occur and to get enough data to really kind of definitively assert that these IoT devices, you know, this type of device can kind of reduce your frequency by this amount. Um, I have talked to carriers that um, they feel that uh, they're seeing, you know, the best gains now, kind of short term, in terms of customer satisfaction, that customers are actually receiving these products or view these products favorably and view the fact that the insurance company seems to care about them, right? Um, having said that, <clears throat> I will tell you that um, I do think, so the, the, the devices obviously come with a cost, and so insurers don't want to bear the full cost of retrofitting everybody's house to be a smart home, right? That'd be great if they did, but understand that's cost prohibitive. And so I am seeing a lot of individuals now um, actually, you know, going to Best Buy and other places to, to, to outfit their home and putting it all on kind of this hub. And so I agree with George that I think the consumer adoption of this technology is actually outpacing the insurer's ability to, to be there kind of offering the devices as the product. And so what that means is that as the insurance carrier, you're kind of at the mercy of what devices they may have already installed in the home. And so that might be a plethora of different devices that, you know, you're not used to uh, part of your package that you might be offering, but you know, you're still going to want to be able to use that data. So some place that, you know, brings all that data together and is able to, to, to sell it or use it, uh, to George's point, I think is exactly the way this is going to go in the future. Yeah, every insurance company wants their policyholders to, to buy and install a inline water shutoff valve 
and every consumer wants to go buy um, mood lighting or a, a, a pet uh, camera, right? right. So yeah, there's, exactly. there's, there's, there's an innate misalignment there in priorities, but I think over time as people get more devices, even the things in their house like thermostats and so forth, um, should they decide that they want to share that information with their consumer or with their, their insurance carriers in exchange for some dynamic pricing? Um, there, there's, there's data that could be pulled out of those that I think they could help support, support them and maybe get them even some more favorable rates. Right. Yeah, good. Here's another question. Um, any insights in applying data regarding quotes? This, just one, this question just came in. Um, insights in applying data regarding quotes for home insurance in coastal areas. Uh, geolocation was mentioned. Other data sources applicable? Question mark. Thank you. Do you have any insights in applying data? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of jump on that one. So um, <clears throat> I will tell you in the past, right, we would ask questions like, you know, or, or get data, right, you know, are you a 1,000 feet from the coast? If you're a 1,000 feet or less, we won't write you. And then you kind of would recognize, well, you know, this guy, he's right on the coast, uh, but he's on a 100-foot high cliff. Well, that's a really different risk fundamentally than some person that's 500 feet in from the coast, but the water is lapping up to his front door at high tide. And so as you start kind of peeling back the layers, you know, you, you're really getting a much more nuanced view of kind of risk in, in, in coastal areas. You can um, now get you know, much better data in terms of base flood elevation, of running different scenarios um, with regarding to, to, to floods, to sea level rise, to... Uh, the impact, you know, of, of wind. Um, aerial imagery is just really revolutionized. It's the combination of aerial imagery, being able to take very, very high quality image. I've seen some that, um, you know, actually there's a picture of these two guys that are playing ping pong in the back uh, porch, and you can actually see the ping pong ball in the air. Uh, that's how good some of the, the imagery is getting. And, um, you know, it's hard for a human to look at every single home and whatnot, but with uh, the use of AI and machine learning, um, they can t pick out things, not just, you know, who in the pool, who holds the trampoline, but you know, who has missing shingles from the roof. Um, right. Does this roof look aged or not? So I think a lot of those types of uh, data points, again, you, you don't have to ask somebody, hey, you know, how, tell me how many shingles are missing off of your roof. Right? You're actually able to get that type of information and um, bring that into some of that uh, underwriting and pricing decisions. So it's um, this kind of richness of data, uh, particularly for catastrophic risk, I think you're going to actually see more availability because nobody wants to lose their shirt in these high risk areas, but everyone's willing to kind of you know, take out some that they think are you know, a little bit lower risk than the rest, right? Um, they think that they've got a competitive advantage in terms of knowing something about this exposure that other competitors don't that make it a little bit better risk to, to write in this generally uh, higher risk area. So I, I think you're going to see more and more of that in the next five years. George, what about you? And this is a perfect question for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think Rob's dead on with the imagery providing some some really nice uh, new tools to help understand. I mean, really thinking about the risk of, of a coastal property, you're really you're worried about where it, where it is exactly, um, and then what what's the the condition and construction of that home. And so um, I think the, the aerial imagery and the computer vision techniques using AI, machine learning, um, is really kind of giving us a new data asset to understand the construction and the condition of the home and how well it's going to be able to weather the weather, um, so to speak, um, along the way. Um, I do think that, you know, as we look at these solutions today, there's going to be and this is this is really true for property in general, right? I mean, um, there's a, it's almost like a patchwork of data. There there are many different data sources out there to help you understand that home, um, but there are very few that are 100% all the time. And so it really becomes a, a kind of patchwork approach to how can we layer together different sources of data, whether it be the public records, uh, you know, tax assessor data, uh, whether it be aerial imagery, whether it be kind of building permits or, or other types of, of, of data assets that are really going to be kind of hit and miss in various areas. I, I think what imagery has done is given us a not a, a, a perfect solution, but a solution that covers the population and covers the, the you know, the, the coverage of the homes is somewhat different. 
uh, and allows us to have a layer of intelligence where maybe we had no intelligence before, and then where we had intelligence before it provides us another level of, of certainty on top of it to help us get to a, a better answer. Well, you've kind of addressed this next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway as our last question. It's, uh, the attendee says, we really struggle with property and roof data. How can the industry as a whole solve these problems? That's a holistic question, definitely. Uh, Rob, what do you think? When, when an insurer is struggling with roof data, um, what should they be thinking about in terms of solving this and getting to the right sources? Yeah, so I do think help is on the way. Um, we talked already about um, there are different uh, aerial imagery providers. So there's drone companies, but um, to be honest with you, some of the cameras are getting so sophisticated um, that you can put them on fixed-wing aircraft, and so you can get pretty high-resolution photos um, at, at scale. Um, and again, we kind of talked about, you know, okay, once you've got all that imagery, then, then being able to kind of use um, this advanced techniques to, to get a sense for the roof. Um, I will also say this, that, that some, you know, many companies can't afford that, right? That's, that's some, you know, pretty high-end stuff. Um, as the technology evolves, I'm sure the price point will, will fall. And so, um, you know, you see more and more carriers probably using that. I think, I think that's still cutting edge today and, and, and won't be five to ten years from now. But I will also say that there are more simple processors, right, like sending a home inspector out to take photos and to mark down on some type of form inspection report what they see uh, that I think um, today are, are, you know, what I classify as dumb, meaning that, you know, once the person has taken the photos and, and entered it in the report, you know, it, it's just in that PDF file or in that, you know, kind of image or document, but um, you don't have any AI machine learning learning from that. And so I think kind of taking dumb processes and making them smart, and what I mean by that is, well, you've already sent the person out there. You've already taken the photos. You already have their notes uh, that might be some unstructured data that they've written down as well as some fielded data that they've kind of you know, captured, right, because you've got it defined on your form. And taking all that and then kind of hooking AI and machine learning uh, 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 you know, on the back end of that and kind of enabling, okay, so now that we have all of these inspection reports, you know, what are we seeing overall about roof conditions in you know, this particular neighborhood or with this type of roofing of this age? Um, I think you can actually get to many of those kind of insights that you're looking for at a much lower price point. Um, and, you know, we, we say these tools, and, and I know people kind of, it sounds really out there, but there's actually open source software that does this, and many uh, you know, kids in universities are, are using these tools and coming out, and um, it, it's pretty remarkable what you can do with the modern uh, technological tools that you just need to find the right people that can enable that uh, within your company. Well, I have to say this, we are out of time. It's time to wrap things up, and I'm, I'm kind of sad to say that because I think we've had a great discussion today. A couple of housekeeping notes. I mentioned earlier that if your question wasn't addressed during the live event, know that a member of the team is going to be responding to you. And attendees will also receive a link to the recording of the event as a follow-up um, uh, in an email. So I want to thank our experts. George Hosfield and Rob Galbraith for their insightful discussion. This was a great discussion today. I think we all learned something new today about what to expect and how to best respond uh, to quoting homeowners coverage. And on behalf of Digital Insurance and our sponsor, LexisNexis Risk Solutions, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.